The paper talks about a round trip time. What is that based on? Where is that the propagation time? delay. From where to where? From when you put something in at one point in the line. Like in the in the worst case, if you're on uh, if you're on the one end of the line, then the round trip is you know you put it in here, right? And the signal will take some time to propagate to this host, so this host won't see it until. But specifically from where to where? I mean, is it just from one host to the very next host on the the thing, or is it from one host all the way down the far end of the network? Um, distance or well, the, ra the round, it depends on the context. Like if they're talking about between two hosts, then they'll mean between any two hosts, which could be side to side or, at the worst case, at the very ends of the subnet. Okay, but if the, if the, the main ether segment is terminated, what? Oh, they, 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 they probably are talking. If they're talking about round trip, they're probably talking about something higher than that, higher level than that. So they're probably talking about a packet going back and forth. I mean, they if, talked about it as if, as if it was something that was commonly understood because they never explained it. Yeah. Why don't um, show me after lecture, and then we can look at the context, and, and I'll be happy to to, ex to talk about that. Can, is there anything you can say about what's the difference between what they described here and what we use today? Because we don't use tapped cables anymore. Yeah. So I'm just I'm just we're just going over some quick questions over the over the Ethernet paper. I mean, today the, the Ethernet um, used to be just these cheap coax cables. Um, which were which were great because they were cheap and and uh, you could connect them up. the The problem is that they don't the the length the effective length of these cables um, at that point in time wasn't as long as people wanted. So what they have what you have now are these category five cables, which have very different properties uh, signal properties, and you use those to to connect instead of using a shared uh, coax cable. Yeah, and the other reason is, you know, sharing, as you can see in the paper, one of the big issues was collisions, right? And so if you have single cables, then you can minimize collisions. You don't have collisions on the cable, right, because you're just, they're just connecting two ends. Um, and if you, they, they, you might have collisions if you, if you connect a lot of these cables together in a hub, right? But the reason these things, these, you know, these, these things that D-Link and Linksys, they sell where you connect things up, usually what they do is they make them a bit smarter now. And instead of being a hub, which just kind of connects everything together with just physical connections, um, they, they use what's called a switch, which actually can do, is a little bit smarter and under, can actually route packages. So you can have, if you have four, a four uh, uh, port switch, and you have two of them, two of the hosts talking to each other in these two, you're not going to get collisions between those communications. So that's so if you see you know when you buy one of these things it's the hubs will be cheaper because they're basically dumb they just send, but the switches are a bit smarter so they'll be a little bit more expensive but these days you know they're, they're, all that's so cheap you might as well just buy a switch. So so is that how you so, so how, how do you accommodate so many hosts to the same cables or like you have like you um, in the same cables? Uh, yeah, I mean they talk about the paper how they cannot connect very many hosts to. Yeah, they, and that's one of the. If you have a switch, like if you if you instead of hubs, if you have switches, which means each link can can operate pseudo independently. Like if you you can have multiple conversations happening at the same time without collisions. That's one of the ways that you get away around uh, having a lot of collisions. But if you're talking, I mean, if if you're having a three-way conversation between three people, even on a switch, you can still have collisions there between packets. And so you'll sometimes some of these switches will have a little collision light that'll you'll see blink every now and then when when you get collisions on the between uh, conversations. Um, but the switch is smarter, so it doesn't just connect everything together into one big effective ether cable. Um, and you know these days they're very cheap. Back then they really didn't they weren't use, they were using these coax instead. So, so, so the ether that protocol is this what you today for? Yeah, most most of the you know most cards these days use Ethernet. There was a, um, a what did IBM have? Something called a token. What's the token ring? Yeah, they had this thing called a token ring, and the idea there was, I mean, the very high level idea was instead of having to try to uh, prevent these collisions, you had some kind of token that allowed you to to control the resource, and you'd kind of pass this token around, and so you know, and that that's how you controlled you, you controlled for collisions. Um, but it, the Ethernet just took off much, much faster and, and better than this token ring thing. The token ring, I, I believe, was proprietary, though. Maybe Stallman would know, but I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, but the Ethernet, I don't know. If, I remember that was developed at Park um, by Bob. Well, you guys saw the authors, Bob Metcalf, um, who has a beautiful, uh, a 
round uh, townhouse over in, in the back bay here, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and I don't know, I don't remember the, about what happened to the other guy, but um, but uh, this was developed at Xerox Park, which is a research lab, so it was published, and it was at that point it was open, and they weren't patenting a lot of things, um, and so that's I, po probably one of the reasons I suspect uh, what it it became so so popular. Although this is not what they use for transmitting over the internet, this is only for like local area or wide area networks, right? Yeah, I mean this is what they use for usually for the for subnets, like the, your local subnets. They definitely don't use that for trans for these big haul, uh, these long haul trunks over the internet. And if it's you know if it's something like fiber, they definitely don't use anything like this. You just you want to stage things as as well as pre-stage things along these these. Uh, Long haul networks, especially because if it's a long cable, then the propagation delay would would really interact badly with the collision me detection mechanism. So, what's the protocol for the long cable? It varies. I mean, in the um, like, the, there's I think that one of the, some of the cooler ones for these fibers. I mean, they do all sorts of multiplexing. They do frequency division multiplexing, and they have lots of different frequencies of light. And then they, uh, you know, they send they send bits encoded as you can send bits encoded as. I actually don't know what, how they particularly, but you can imagine they encode, they can encode them as phase shifts or as or as uh, you know the absence or presence of of a particular color uh, uh, of a particular frequency. Um, th this that research is going so fast. I mean, it's I haven't kept up with it at all. But there's a lot of good stuff on, on that out there. Uh -huh. You say that's used for uh, subnets. I, I, I'm familiar with inter uh, Ethernet being used commonly like for a university network mm -hmm. or something like that. But would it, for example, with a, you know, you've got a cable modem connection mm -hmm. at your home, and I know you use an Ethernet card to connect to the, the, the cable modem. Right. But from there, is it still using Ethernet? Unlikely. Would that be considered a subnet, or is they would. Um, they, it's unlikely that they would be using it just because of the infrastructure. There's actually um, they, there's there's companies that are that are out there that build infrastructure specifically for to handle that type of traffic. There's these things called head ends that you build where, where you where you ha where you distribute out. You take a big trunk comes in from the cable company and kind of distributes out the data. Um, and there's a lot of work being done there to try to squeeze more data out. Um, there's all sorts of issues because that cable that comes in also has the t you know all the tv signals so you can't i mean you don't want the an ethernet like protocol on there unless you want a lot of you know occasional static on your tv um, because of these because of these you know squelches that you, you put on so that's one of the issues that they that they face um, now one of the things you could do is you could actually piggyback an ethernet protocol um, on a frequency that's outside of the of the of the range that's being uh, frequencies outside of the range that's being used by the tv um, but I, I mean, in, in a sense, sometimes it doesn't make sense to do that because if you're just, I mean, especially in the last link, there's one cable coming from some place coming to your house, right? And and it's just a point-to-point -point link in that sense from some you know head end or, or equivalent to the cable modem. So the Ethernet protocol is really it's more interesting when you're sharing some some medium when there's a shared link to communicate over. And if you guys noticed in the paper, it was um, they referenced the uh, the Aloha work at uh, in Hawaii, and so they they saw that. I mean, that's part of where they got this idea was, you know, there's if, if you have if you're transmitting EM over the airwaves, it's in, in essence an, uh, a shared coax cable. It's the same kind of medium in a sense. It's a broadcast medium with propagation delays, with with the signal degradation over over distance. Um, so they took that idea and and, tr and converted it into something implemented in a different medium. Okay, are there other questions about this this Ethernet paper? So the last time we were talking about network layering, and we talked about uh, how we can take these seven layers of the OSI uh, network uh, abstraction and condense them down into three. So we talked about the link layer, which is about actually getting data from one point to the next. Uh, and we talked about the network layer, which implements getting data across a network. And uh, for the internet, the network layer um, provides something that's uh, that's very simple, like it's just sending datagrams, best efforts. We talked about you know what that means. Uh, so now let's go up to the next layer up, which is the end-to-end -end layer, and this is representative of the four other layers uh, that we saw in the OSI, the four highest layers. 
So what is this layer about? It's about implementing more, more functionality or more apparent functionality on top of an unreliable network layer in our case. Now, what we do there is depending on what our end application needs, we can do things like try to compensate for latency, uh, try to do something about ordering of, of uh, messages or, or datagrams or packets, depending on what layer you're talking about. Um, you can talk about, you can do something like adding more checks to improve data integrity. Uh, you can try to improve routing accuracy, though you have to be careful with that because you might, you don't want to violate the abstraction that, uh, the routing abstraction below uh, in the network layer, uh, at least not without good reason. And one bi other big thing is uh, you, you might want to add security. Now, not all applications are going to need all of these, so what you end up doing is creating a set of transport protocols to help d to use depending on which application uh, what your application's requirements are. So transport protocols uh, typically send messages or streams across the network. I'm going to use the terms messages to refer to a set of data that at the at the application at the end-to-end -end layer. And messages, think of messages as when you hand that message down to the network layer, it can break it up into into datagrams, which can be then broken up into packets by the network. Um, now, the, when, you, the, when you have these transport protocols, the sources and destinations on these are, are hosts attached to the networks. So you're sending a message from one host to another host. Um, and and, and I, I'm sorry, one level above that. The sources and destinations are actually applications running on hosts uh, on, that are on the network. So if you have some network and you have some host here, someone here. Remember at the network layer, you think about sending uh, datagrams from here to here. At this end-to-end -end layer, you think about the applications that are running. So um, Netscape and AOL server. Netscape is going to send a message to an AOL server somewhere else, somewhere out on the network. Okay, that's the level of abstraction that we're at. Typically, the way these things work is that uh, there's an abstraction called a port. How many of you guys have heard of this, of ports? So, so machines will have, um, well, if you go to a, like your Linux machine, it, you'll see there's, this, there's a file in there that lists a bunch of ports and a bunch of services. So there's uh, things like HTTP, and there's things like um, UDP, and, and there's SMTP, and these are all these different, and they represent uh, different types of applications like Netscape and, and your um, some kind of mail and so on. And what you do is that you agree upon certain ports being the place where you listen to for sending or receiving a message. So that's how you know that this message is supposed to go to a particular ap application. So if you send something to port uh, 80, does anyone know what port 80? Rep HTTP. HTTP. So port 80 is typically where, HTT where you talk HTTP back and forth. Um, what's FTP? Uh, 20, is it? 23, 23, FTP is 23. I think it uses another one too, potentially, depending on the type of FTP, um, which is what you use to transfer files around. What about um, email? Like SMTP, 25 is SMTP. So what ends up happening is when one of these, when a server, for example, when you start up a server, like AOL server, it goes to the operating system and it'll say, okay, I'm a server and I'm going to be listening on port 80. So operating system, whenever you get you know, a message coming in at the network layer that's addressed to port 80, give it to me, and I'll deal with it. And, that, and, and that's how, and similarly on this other side, um, when AOL server sends something back, right, Netscape here can be listening, uh, or we'll, 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 be, we'll be getting that message back because of uh, the way the ports are addressed. So what is this? What is a, a, a send or receive a generic message send or receive protocol look like? Well, the send is going to have a destination address, a destination port. So together, the address and the port refer to an application. 
running on the other side. And then you want a reply port so that this thing knows you know, what port is, is to, re to reply to over here so that the proper application, the client, gets it. And then you need the actual message itself. Now, one thing that isn't in that interface is the source address. Why do you think that might not be? As, why, why do you think that isn't necessarily needed as part of a, an inter, a send type interface? Yes. If you're just sure. forwarding in a protocol, um, you don't really want to be adding it. Okay. If you're sending something, you don't necessarily. But it, what if you do want something to come back? Which in this case, you know, an HTTP request for a file, for some file, which then you expect to come back. You do have the reply port, right? But why, why, do, why wouldn't you want to put that? I mean, you could put the the, the source port, uh, the source address in there, but. Do you think that's necessary? Yeah, that's right. The lower layer, the lower layer, lower layers know they, you know what your source your source address is. In fact, when you're writing this code, it would be redundant for you to have to grab this source address all the time, and so that's typically included in the in the lower layer. So when this this guy receives it, the lower layer will tell him, oh, this is where you know this is where it came from, and that's always if you're assuming you're on the same host over here, then then you, know, you let someone else manage it. If you're on a mobile host, then it's even better to let someone else manage it because you might not know. You, know, you don't want to be sitting there having to deal with where am I right now before you send every message. So the general receive interface is, um, is typically something like accept. And what you get in, as input to that is the source address, which is given to you computed by a lower network layer. Uh, the source reply port and the incoming message, both of which were uh, part of the send. Now, one of the ways that you can implement this is what, by what's called a callback procedure. And so what happens is that AOL server will say something like, here's my callback procedure, and it'll give that to the operating system, and it'll say, it'll tell, here's my, here's this, here's the port that I want to listen to. And it tells the OS, Whenever you get a message that is uh, that is that comes in on this port, call this procedure, and that'll transfer in my process. You know, bring up my process, call this procedure, and I'll do the right thing. So why would you want that type of, of mechanism as opposed to a, what's a, what's a otherwise known as a polling mechanism, where you sit there and you go and ask the operating system every time you get switched in. You know, is there a message? Is there a message? Overhead, very good. So what the thing is, in order for you to, to you for in order for AOL server, for example, to explicitly check each time, it has to be swapped in, right? It ha or potentially, or it has to be con there has to be a context switch for it to, to do that. Um, much easier, much better if it just sits there, you know, wherever it is, and does nothing until something until something until a message actually arrives. And that the reason I bring up that point is because from a scalability point of view. Um, I have a friend who actually, uh, uh, I'll use instant messaging as an example. He um, did an instant messaging startup that was, uh, that it was later sold to Microsoft. And one of the things that, one of the, one of the uh, techniques they used was they said, well, if we sit there and we pull all the time, which is what typically, you know, if, you're, if you, you just think, well, what's the easiest thing I'll do? I'll just pull and wait and see until something comes. The overhead associated with that would just end up killing you. This doesn't allow it to be scalable. This, there's just all sorts of, of bad scalability issues. But by doing it, by doing this more event-driven or interrupt-driven type style, where you're where you get called when when something actually arrives, it it allows for a lot, the server to handle a lot, a huge, I mean, order of magnitude more uh, traffic. What would have been what would be the advantage of polling? Of po the advantage of polling? Yeah, like why would I mean, that, that's a big cost, but why would anyone choose to do that in the first place? Oh, ease, of, ease of, of implementation. Like this this whole callback scheme, I mean, callbacks, is something that's not, that. if you're a beginner programmer, you probably is, is something, you, you know, that seems a bit more complex than what you're used to. And as you get, as you as you become a better programmer, then it becomes very intuitive and you start using them all over the place and you love them. But if you, you know, if you're just someone who says, oh, I'm going to do an internet instant messaging internet startup, and you don't have a lot of coding experience, you might decide, oh, this is easy. I just do a polling loop, and then whenever something comes in, I just handle it. So this is one of those nuggets that, like, you know, they, that 
if you have someone, you know, someone taught me, someone, you know, I'm teaching some of you guys. Some of you guys probably have done this a lot of times already. Callback system, something's pulling, right? Not necessarily. It depends on um, how the uh, operating system handles interrupts. So you can imagine um, down in the lowest layer, you have at the link layer, right, the Ethernet card gets some, some incoming message. Well, it, it can raise an interrupt, which then the processor will, you know, will go out and handle. So we were talking about messages before. What about streaming? So here we're starting to get into the, the, the question about connections versus not. Um, in a generic streaming protocol, you do have this idea of a, a connection that you open and close. So you'll have, you'll open a connection. Um, if you want to receive data, you'll open a connection. And what that does is it has a destination address. So somewhere else it's going to feed you that stream. But once you open that, what you'll get back is some identifier that says, here's how you get access to that, to that streaming data. And so that's, that's the equivalent of opening, uh, of, of setting up. And then there's also the notion of teardown, which is close. Uh, now, if you're going to be, if you're the server and you're going to be writing that data back, um, once you, there's going to be some idea, some notion there of a stream ID that you just write data to. And whenever you, whenever you write data, it just flows over, the, the network layer gets it and boom, it sends it over. Now notice that the writes here don't require a destination address. Why not? Yeah, so in essence, remember before when we were talking at the lowest layer that there was this notion of, of state that you had to keep if you were thinking about connections, which was, you know, in, in terms of the asynchronous network, which of the, you know, if you're doing time division multiplexing, which of the pulses was actually yours, and you kept that. It, in this case, we're at a higher layer, but we still have this state that we're keeping around, which is for this stream ID, where's the destination host, where's the destination port? And so you would expect that that streaming all the way down, this would be the case, that that state would be, there would be state maintained. So when you write something, it would just be forwarded by the, by the actual, the protocol would man, the implementation would manage that forwarding, excuse me, for you. Okay. Now the read interface, there's lots of different ways you can imagine getting a stream ID. Um, one of them is to go out there and say, I want a service, uh, a service, I want this particular type of service like video or Windows media and, and I want, here's the name of the thing and there can be some name resolution that happens behind your back that gets that. So, you know, this is like, I want a real video stream that has, uh, you know, that's, that's this video of, of whatever in sync and that'll give you back a stream ID and then what you do is you can just call, you know, get more stream data to suck this, to suck this data out. Um, and then you need to know when the end of that stream is. So one of the reasons you might want to explicitly get, use this get more stream, stream data instead of some callback is that you may only be able to handle the stream data coming in at a certain rate. Um, so if you, if you want, if you want to, for example, grab enough bits to create a video frame, then you can sit there and get the data, and then when you have one, you do a computation and you render it on the screen, and then you say get more stream data and try to get the next thing, and you can handle at that level whether there's you know some some uh, some uh, 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 frames that are missing and and try to adjust there. Uh, but that's so this is one reason why you might not want a callback if you're in the middle of getting a stream. There's probably something that's computationally uh, intensive that you want to be able to manage a bit better. Somewhere there has to be a buffer that holds whatever's coming in. Right. Is that, right. Is that uh, locally? That it, it's probably, well, there'll be, there could be buffering anywhere throughout the network, but there's probably, I would, I would impl if I were doing the implementation, I'd have a local buffer also. And if you look at, I mean, if you have these applications, these real applications and so on, you'll notice that if you go into the options, a lot of these have some kind of buffer that you can adjust. So, so these buffers can actually be exposed to the end user. Um, and especially in something like a video application, you might want to buffer lots of data, uh, especially if you get it in bursts. Um, so you might want to increase that buffer size, but if in something like video, if you're getting high quality video, it might be megabytes uh, of buffer that you want. So that's one of the reasons why it might be exposed to a user is that it, it might, increasing that buffer size might decrease your machine performance because you might have to swap. The time that we pull in the additional data, we have to, put it someplace to um, store it while we're dealing with it. Mm -hmm. 
So we have to have an internal buffer. And this is going to require us to have kind of a, a slightly more external buffer. Yeah, well, there's an application level buffer. And then there's the natural buffers that you get from the, from the operating system. So the operating system itself will, be, will buffer data that comes in, network data that comes in. And it has its own buffering scheme. And there's some, if you go into the Windows registry, you can change some of these parameters and have it allocate more or less. Um, this is especially important when you're, when you're on a modem or on a slow uh, connection. You can actually adjust buffers even all the way down to your, your, um, your, the chip that, actually, that sends the, the signal back and forth. You can, there's some adjustments you can make as to how big its send or receive buffer is going to be. Um, and the reason those kinds of things are exposed, even though it's a, a lower layer to the users, is because they can have a huge impact on performance. In the video case, um, the end user buffer is huge. It's something so big that a, an operating system would never allocate something that big. Um, you know, it could be megabytes depending on how, the quality of your video. So that, but the end-to-end -end argument comes to play here, which is that you don't want the operating system or the lower layers having this huge buffer just because in case you get video, because then everybody else has to pay that price. Does that make sense? It does, although. It I get it intuitively it seems like the external buffer, the one that's outside of this get more data stream, it seems like that one would have to be larger because that one has to wait until we decide to get more data. That uh, one has, it to, has to it that, has to yeah. store everything until we decide to get more data. Right. So it, and so it seems it, like that's gonna have to be at least as large as the internal application yeah. buffer. And it, it depends on the specifics. So for example, if you were um, doing some kind of voice and you were on a gigahertz processor that wasn't very loaded, you could probably process the voice very quickly, and you might be able to grab it as fast as it comes out and, and do something with it. Um, but if you're doing this high-res video on a, you know, a Pentium or Pentium 2 even, then you, you, and you don't have a lot of hardware support, then you might need the larger buffer. So the buffer size is going to be dependent on the bottleneck in the system. And if the bottleneck is the processor, then you know, you'll have to increase that buffer size. If it's, if it's not, if the bottleneck is the network, then your buffer doesn't have to be as large. So let's look at some more real examples. Um, there's the, the family of IP, of Mumble IP. So IP is the, the network layer that does the internet protocol. So that's the layer that you give a message to to get it from one end of the internet to, to anywhere else on the internet. Now built on top of that, there are some, uh, some protocols. So UDP, TCP, and RGP are three protocols that are built on top of IP. So you've heard TCP IP. That, isn't, that's, that protocol, TCP IP, is actually two separate protocols at different layers in the network uh, framework. So UDP, um, here what we're doing is uh, adding the notion of ports and adding a level of data integrity, and that's it. So this is a very bare bones type of, of, uh, of protocol. So this is well, all this protocol really allows you to do is do very simple uh, application to application communication uh, on top of IP. So remember, IP will just get something from one host to the other. That's the layer at which, it's, at which it sits. UDP, which sits one layer above that, thinks at the level of applications and therefore introduces this notion of ports. Um, and uh, this, I meant here, this is what on top of, oh, um, the, the data integrity. This also does an extra, a uh, little bit more data integrity checking. So it does another checksum. Now remember before the link layer did a checksum. Remember that, how, how we said for so many bits it's going to do, you know, whatever, 8-bit checksum, whatever it might be. Uh, to check data integrity. This one adds a level on top of that. Now, why would it? Why is it a good idea to add a little bit more uh, data integrity checking on top of that if the link layer is already doing something? Is that is that totally redundant, or are there some places where the the errors can occur that that one might check and the other might not? Okay, well, the UDP packet header, if it's being transmitted by the link layer, anything that, that goes from one link to another, that's, there's checksums against it. Um, so anything that's actual, that, that's data that's, that a link layer, that the link layer receives, it's going to say, I'm going to compute a checksum over the whole thing, whether it be pack header or payload or whatever it might be. 
Let me check any. Uh, go ahead. The, the article said the, the, net, the data for memory in general form would have been checked. Okay, good. So there's the switches, the switches along the way. Right, remember, these guys have to, if in a storm forward net network, like we talked about before, there's buffering that happens. There's, um, at the network layer, there's taking, you can have a, a datagram that's broken up into smaller packets that are sent. And during the process of breaking them up, there could be data corruption. So there are stages along the way where the link layer isn't involved at all. Doing um, some da a little bit more of data integrity on top of that at this layer uh, takes, in takes into account all of these different steps that happen that are not explicitly part of the link layer. Is that just the passing up and down between layers of abstraction? Is that what you're talking about? Yep. 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 That's it. <laughs> so one of them um, is RTP, which is a real-time protocol that's built on top of UDP. And there, uh, the idea is you add time stamping. UDP is, you would think, is, is basically everything you need for streaming, except that you want to make sure that you get, you can order these, these, uh, packets when they come in. So if you're sending a video, you know, one video frame and another video frame, you want to make sure you put them in the right order. The time stamping helps you do that. Now, there aren't any other, um, integrity uh, guarantees. They just use whatever UDP uses. Um, there aren't any guarantee, there aren't any, uh, reattempts to, to, uh, to send packets that didn't make it. And that's because, like we talked about yesterday, the nature of streaming is that if you miss a packet or you miss a, a message, um, you know, by the time you you get it back, it's probably too late. You're already several frames more into the video or, or audio stream. TCP IP has a lot of guarantees on the messages that are being transported. Uh, again, again, it sits on top of IP, the network layer, and it has some guarantees. So messages have to be have to arrive in the same order that they're sent. You can't have missing packets. You can't have duplicate packets. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, this would be missing uh, messages, duplicate messages. Uh, there is some extra error checking that's being done, and there is some flow control. And this is what you use when you want something that's more reliable. When you want to do something like uh, HTTP, or when you want to do something like uh, having a, a session between uh, between two computers, you probably want something that has these types of properties. And so TCP/IP is a, a generic uh, transport protocol that you can build other protocols on top of that need all of these types of properties. Um, as you can as you can see here, there's all sorts of overhead involved in TCP/IP that you may not need if you're just thinking about streaming or, or something more simple like that. So is the TCP not dealing with packets, but lo only looking at the message? Level? Messages, that's right. It's looking at a message. So the transport, so you give TCP a message, and then it gives it to the network layer. And the network layer says, either I'm going to send this as one datagram, or it can send it as multiple datagrams. It, it can do whatever so it needs to. packets and datagrams? Yeah, packets I'm using to refer to the lowest la the link layer data and then datagrams to the network layer data, and then messages to the end-to-end -end user data, uh, la layer data. That's why I, I, this is, I used the wrong term here. But UDP talks about, proto about datagrams, and yet it's at the lowest level of UDP. Um, there, there, the, the, yeah, that should, have, that, should have been, that should have been messages. If I, if I, no, 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 oh. it's just the meaning of D in UDP. It's not, it's not you, it's just what does D mean in UDP? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm just using this terminology so that I can be, I can try to keep, you know, layers, the, the, the layer, the level that I'm talking to straight. Um, when, so that we know when, when I say message, we're talking about the end to end layer and so on. But yeah, I should, I, I should be careful about that. Okay. End to end layer is above the network level? Yes. Okay. Yes. The network layer IP is the protocol that's used to, at the network layer for the internet. And TCP, UDP, those are all end to end? Yeah, those are all at the higher. At the transport layer or, or above, like HTTP is, is a couple layers above that and built on top of things like TCP IP. Mm -hmm. And one thing that um, you'll notice is that when you send things across the Internet, right, even if you're on a Microsoft type of, of network, you're still able to interface to uh, the Internet. But what you'll notice is that there's usually there's some kind of difficulty in trying to to, to merge both of those types of networks unless you have some box 
or something sitting in between them that talks both of those types of protocols. And even then, the semantics of the protocols may be different enough that you can't have all the functionality back and forth. Um, what's, what you do uh, at times when you want to merge these networks is that you'll, you'll have some kind of, uh, of piggybacking or encapsulation where if you wanted to talk the Microsoft protocol across, across the Internet, you'll take the mic what the Microsoft, all, this, all the information the Microsoft product protocol needs and stuff it into a message and then give that to TCP IP and have that be sent and then it gets decoded that gets decoded on the other side is, okay, now I've got my payload for my TCP IP. Now let me break that up into my Microsoft you know, style protocol and then let me do something with it. So that's why you can do things like if you're on one side of the Internet and someone else has network sharing, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, drive sharing available on the other side of the internet, and you're both on Microsoft machines, if you know their IP address and they haven't protected their, their uh, shares, you can access it. Um, there, I actually read a story recently about someone who's making a Napster version of this thing that goes out and figures out who's got unprotected sh uh, Microsoft you know, shares available, and it, it's, it gives you this directory and then you can just go in there and, and oh, it'll give you files so you can search for file names and stuff like that. And, and you can actually connect to the machines and do a, anything. By default, that's everyone using Windows everywhere. Is it on? I thought file sharing wasn't on by default. I'm pretty sure it's on by default. Really? Because these guys were arguing actually that one of the, I mean, you can imagine they're in legal, all, this legal, all these legal issues. But one of the things they argued was that it wasn't on by default. So it, they argued that someone would have to intentionally yeah, their argument was you would have to intentionally uh, turn it on. The paper actually says under certain cases it's, it's on by default, but it, only if they turn on a certain networking, which I yeah. understand. Yeah, so they, it, it takes explicit action. What's that? They're, they're not routable by default, so you have to have somebody routing those packets, so they won't get the your local network. Yeah, and in fact, um, that's an interesting point. Something like Media One. They, they don't route those packets at all at, uh, uh, coming out of the, the port that Microsoft uses for security reasons because when you're on something like Media One, even though it's not Ethernet, there is some sense of, be, of having a shared segment. So in theory, you, if someone else, if the ports were, were not blocked, you could actually look at your neighbor's files and if they had their shares available. How does it work this thing with messages arrived in the same order as they're sent? Because I guess two messages could be sent different that's right. Um, so one of the things you can do is have a, a sequence ID and that, you, that you put as part of the header for the message. And so at the receiver side, the TCP IP implementation will look at the sequence that comes in and say, okay, well, if I got message number one, message number two, and message number four, then I have to wait until message number three before I deliver message number four. So it'll, it'll, it can, at, the, at the receiver side, it can wait until it gets the next element in the sequence, and if it doesn't get it, then it can go back and say, say, you know, I didn't get it, send, resend it to me. Um, but what happens, all these properties here are what you see if you're on top of TCP IP. So if you're on top of TCP IP, you shouldn't expect to get any, any duplicate messages. Right? If you got a message once, you shouldn't expect another one to just appear. The TCP IP implementation should just not even send it to you if it, if it receives a duplicate. Okay. Yes? Just a question about the flow control of this level. That seems like something that should be happening at a lower level. I was just wondering why that, um, like, yeah. Yeah, it is. That's a good, very good point. A good observation is that there is some, uh, somewhat of an abstraction violation here, um, and we're going to actually the last couple slides are going to be on flow control itself, so we'll get into that. But there is somewhat of an abstraction violation. Usually, when you see an abstraction violation, it's if it's for good reason, it tends to do with reason with performance, and in this case, it, you'll see that there's a lot there are a lot of performance issues. Um, you can do flow control at various levels layers in the network. And we'll see how it's done here. Um, oh, flow control. Um, it's how you control. It's a way of controlling congestion. So let's think about some of the um, some of the uh, about the implementation of some of the different types of semantics that we had talked about before. So remember, we talked about at least once delivery. If you have an at least once delivery protocol, what you're in essence saying is that 
the message will get through to the receiver. At least one copy of the message will get through. You might get duplicates, but there'll be at least one. Um, but let's think about that a little bit more. So the message can consist of one or more datagrams. Uh, the datagram header, in this case, will contain an ID or some kind of identifier that, that says here's a, this, a, that differentiates the different datagrams. Um, now, what the, what the sender will do is give this datagram um, or, or message to the network layer, which divides it into datagrams, um, and then it'll wait for an acknowledge, and then it'll retry after a timeout. So let's think about how that would work. So here's a datagram, and what you do is you send it over the, the sender and the receiver, and you send it over here, and then the receiver says, okay, I got it, right? Now this, what this is, is a, oh, it's called the lockstep protocol. So in this case, you send a datagram, you get an acknowledge back. You send another one, you get another one back, and so on, okay? Um, now, this, is, this will work fine from, a, from an at, once, uh, at least once delivery point of view, except you're, you have to assume that the network is reliable, <coughs> that the network itself will get the message eventually to the receiver. And yesterday we learned that the Internet, as, as one example, is not a reliable network. It, does best, it ha does best efforts, but it could run into congestion or some other issues. So you're not actually sure that this message will get there. So that's actually why you need this acknowledgement. You need the acknowledgement to make sure so that the sender knows that it was received. And if there's a timeout period on this, if you don't hear back from the receiver after a certain amount of time, you can just resend it. And that means that there could be several copies of this that go through because actually the acknowledgement might get blocked. Oh, question? Okay. Um, now, one question is what timeout period should be used in this type of scheme? And you can have a fixed timeout, and that's simple but not optimal. Um, and one of the reasons it's not optimal is that, you know, guess what? Traffic patterns on the Internet change. So if your timeout, if, if, you're, if it turns out there's congestion and the packets are going to take a little longer to get from, point, from the sender to the receiver, then you want to make sure that your timeout isn't too short such that you keep sending a bunch of duplicates because your, your timer keeps going off. You want to make sure it's not too long such that you send something and then you're sitting there, the receivers you know, could be sitting there waiting for something and just you, know, you both could be sitting there waiting and nothing ever happens uh, for a long, long time. So um, there's some, uh, like in the Ethernet, you read about this exponential back off algorithm. There's, you can do a similar type of thing here where you know, if, if the timeout that you're getting doesn't seem to be right because you're, you're, you're picky, you, you either don't hear, you realize that you're sending too many because you're getting too many acts back or that not, it isn't working because it seems like your timeout is too long, you can readjust exponentially to try to get very close to a more optimal uh, timeout as soon as possible. Okay. An acknowledgement. Um, when you see act that, that in, in networking papers, that typically means an acknowledgement for something that was a message that was sent. So another um, way to do this is to have the receiver use what are called negative acknowledgements. Now, in this case, what you do is each datagram has to have some kind of sequence number so you know how many, you know whether you have all the datagrams in a message or not. Now, imagine that you're the receiver and you receive two of them. Well, what you can do is send back a negative acknowledgement and say, oh, for this message, I need you to send me back the second in this sequence of three, or these five different datagrams in the sequence of 100. Um, and you send that one negative acknowledgement back, and then when the sender receives it, they can send those, they can forward only those datagrams that, were, that are missing. Now, the, the, um, the nice thing here is that we're doing that, having one negative acknowledgement being sent back per message. So we have a little bit of an optimization in that we don't have to be, we don't have to have all these acts, uh, uh, we don't have to have the, uh, there to be one uh, potential acknowledgement per datagram. Instead, what we have is at the receiver side, they just send one NAC back when, they, when they're missing things. Now, you also have to have a timer here because at some point, you know, if you're supposed to receive, you know, 15 datagrams, 
and and you say, okay, well, you know, when do I send the NAC? You know, how long do I wait before I send the NAC? So there still has to be a timer. So the timing timer issues are still around, um, but the delay is now the delay that you get in completing this is now per message instead of a, a per datagram. Mm -hmm. Is there a timeout going the other way so that it knows to send another NAC if it doesn't receive the datagram? Yeah, and it's it's funny. This is one of the reasons timers are actually they're, they're a necessary evil in some sense, is that when you use timers, you start getting into these things like you know, well, do I have to send a, an ACK for the NAC, <laughs> and, and you know, and how long do I wait for that thing, and then what about a uh, you know an ACK for the, and so you can get into all these all this complexity um, just because you're timing out on things. But there, I mean, that that sometimes you just have to bite the bullet and just. Do this a couple levels, and at some point, just you know, give up and say, you know, failed. Do NACs get executed? In some systems, they do. <laughs> because when you send the NAC over, it'd be nice if you got an ACK back saying, "Okay, I got this." You know, expect the expect the NAC, expect the datagrams to be coming. This is a great setup for what's called the two generals problem, um, and this is uh, this was framed by a guy named Jim Gray. And what he basically said was that there's never going to be a 100% guarantee that a message is, is delivered, no matter how many of these acts and NACs and so on that you use. And so the, um, the question is, how, imagine, this is a little militaristic. <laughs> so there's some city here. And imagine that there's two, there, there's, there's two generals, one sitting over here with his or her army and one sitting over here with another army. And the idea is that this city is powerful enough to repel an attack by either one of these. If either one attacks, boom, gone. But if they both attack at the same time, they can take the city. Okay. Um, now, how, how would you expect that these two will coordinate? Well, they, they probably will have some runners. You know, that this one will go and take, send a message over here saying, let's attack tomorrow at, you know, tomorrow at, at midnight. And then this one will come back and say, Got it. You know, tomorrow at midnight, all set. Um, now the problem here is that these these people in the city aren't dumb, and, <laughs> and they know that these guys are going to be doing this. And so what they have are a bunch of snipers sitting around, and you know, whenever they actually can can prevent runners from going back and forth. So it's Jim. Just go, just go with me on it. Um, so so what do you, so what's the problem that can arise? Well, imagine that this general sends a runner out, okay, and but never hears anything back. What are the two possibilities? All right, either here or here. All right, and, and the thing is, if this general knows, I mean, if this general knows that, if this general does receive it and knows that, that you know, his or her runner can get nailed, is he going to attack before he gets something back? Probably not, right? Because if you attack and you don't know if the if the other general has has done anything, then your then you could destroy your whole army could be destroyed. So the question here is, when you have unreliability, how do you coordinate these two to make sure that these messages to make sure that there's this hundred percent guarantee that a message was delivered? And it turns out that you can prove that there's no way that this could be the case. Um, because in the way you prove it is you say, suppose there was a way that you could do this where you're sending AX or NAX or whatever it was, completely reliable, that, was, that would guarantee that both of them were coordinated. Well, if you take that algorithm and say that there's N steps in it, uh, runners going back and forth, if you, uh, because of the unreliability of this network, you always have to assume that any one of these could, could get squashed. So let's say that this, this one was squashed. Right? Then this algorithm, the, what it implies about this algorithm is that all you really needed were n minus one steps to guarantee that they were both coordinated. And then if you go back to the, to the, you know, if you reduce that all the way down, it shows that, I mean, you basically there is no algorithm because at the end, at the end point, you're back to a situation where there's only one step, which is one runner going, and that there's there's no solution to that. So given that type of argument. Um, I mean, it proves you can't, with an unreliable network, coordinate like that or, or assure at least once delivery. Now, what you can do is you can try to make, uh, reduce the probability of failure to something very small. And how do you do that? Well, one thing is, um, imagine if you, if over here, if you get 
all of a sudden you get, uh, you know, ten runners, and they all run out at the same time, and you know, the, and and you 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 hope that at least one of the ten will get through, right? And depending on the distribution of of the of the uh, unreliabilities here, um, you know, you can calculate what the probability is that one will get through. So the more that you send, right, the higher the probability that at least one will get through. And so by knowing something about some of the statistical properties about the network, you can actually decide how many of these you're going to send and in what order and, and, and at what, how you're going to stage them to uh, reduce the probability to something that's very small. And it'll, it could take, the, the trade-off is that it could take a lot of resources, including time, to get to, the, to, get to that. But that's, that's really the only real optimization you can do to, which, which could work, um, very well in practice, because if you can get the probability down to less than, say, the probability that an electron is going to destroy your, I mean, a cosmic ray is going to come and disrupt your, your whole chip, that's, a, that's pretty reasonable. I mean, you can assume that, that if, if a cosmic ray is destroying your chip, that, that you've got other problems. With that said, let's talk a little bit about end-to-end -end performance. Um, if one of the things that one of the problems in a network, as we saw before, was congestion. Right? So congestion. Um, who can tell me what congestion was? Who was here yesterday? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of packets going around. So it's very difficult for your packet to get through. Good. So there's so many packets coming in that you're overflowing a buffer in one of these packet switches and. And at, at, what does a, what does a, a network like the internet typically do when there's congestion and it doesn't have any place to store all these incoming packets? Drop. Drops them on the floor. Boom, gone. Uh, so that's bad. So you want to be able to, one of the things you want to be able to do is, in, in, to get better end-to-end -end performance, is to somehow control how the, how these packets are going through the network, um, and in a way that minimizes the, the chance that you're going to have congestion along the way, or if you do detect congestion, that compensates for it. Um, so one thing that you can do here is uh, somewhat of a lockstep protocol, boom, 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 boom. And this is nice, it's simple, um, it's effective, but it just it, it costs, it is too much time, you're going to waste too much time waiting back for the acknowledgement each, each time, going back and forth. Um, but what it does give you is that you know, you send one, you're going to be sending, if you, if you take out the ax here, you're going to be sending at a rate, right, that the receiver can receive at. Right? That's the whole point of, of trying to do this, to maximize the rate that you're sending to match the rate that the receiver can, can suck packages in at. Um, so the problem with this is that um, you, if you keep going back and forth like this, you get into a, uh, in, in the, the performance issues are, are bad, so how do you get around some of these performance issues so that you don't have so many acts, like one act per every, for every datagram? Well, what you do in that case is you do what's called windowing. And instead of this here, what you do is you send a set of datagrams at once. Now, a set of datagrams, in this case, there's four of them. That's your window, basically, is these four datagrams. And then what you do is, but you don't wait. You send the next datagram before the acknowledgement comes back for it. So you send these four, boom, 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 boom. And at some point, you'll be getting acknowledgements back. All right, but now look at what, at what happens. How long does it take to transmit these four? Well, you go boom, 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 and then... By the time you're already starting to send these other ones, you're already receiving acknowledgments, right? So in essence, the time that it's going to take you is the time that it takes to send those plus the time that it takes to receive the last acknowledgment. And so that's a much better, yes? Why don't they just send one act back saying they received the whole window or one NAC saying they received the whole window except number three? Yeah, and that's a good optimization. You still end up getting the same time if you get this one at the end back. It's still... The last, it's it's still the the however long it takes to send to get these over plus the reply the the reply time for the last packet that comes back, which is could be a knack. So what we're primarily concerned with here is not uh, minimizing network traffic, but mi minimizing latency time. Minimizing um, drop packets. What you want to do is minimize the amount of of well, packets that get this dropped. This isn't going to minimize any 
drop packets versus the lockstep? Oh, so this is this is an optimization over that. So the the lockstep. It's still going to have as many drop packets though. It's just, and it's still going to have the same amount of network traffic. It's just going to have less time to transfer them. Right, and that's the optimization. Is there's, there's the thing that you want to make sure the problem you don't want to face is having these packets dropped at some point. So you want to start pumping them in as fast as you can. So the lockstep is one way to start pumping them in in a way that doesn't get you these drop packets because you get an act back each time. So that, but that's a very simple one that doesn't, that's not very, that, that takes more time than it should. So here what we're trying to do is pump up the rate at which we send these, these datagrams out. So remember before we had this idea where we, we send when we come back, we send when we come back. And so to do four of these, we have we spend this much time, right? So we we know that's probably I mean that that's the the simplest case and and, and we know that that if we get some kind of uh, congestion there, I mean there's there's nothing you can do about it at that point. Um, but what we want to do is that simplest case. We want to say well how can we increase the rate at which we're sending these packets and still not cause congestion? So we're starting off with the, the simple case, which, which, at which point the congestion isn't, isn't your fault because you're sending only one thing at a time. And then you're trying to make it into a more optimized case where, you, where, you, where the congestion could be caused by you if you send these things too fast. And you want to find what the right point, you know, how, much, how fast you can send these out at in order for you not to cause congestion. And make this a little more concrete just so that you make the point. Imagine that... Here we had um, a buffer size of two Oops. at this point in the network. And say the rest of the network was really fast. And at some point, there was something that had a buffer size of two. Well, if we send, and we're just doing the lock step, boom, 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 one after the other. Um, and we send something. If this is already congested, then we're out of luck. We can't do anything. But assume that there's no congestion here. Well, what we're doing is we're sending one, and then here, you know, it gets read in here, and then it gets sent out. Great. Now let's say that we increase our window size to two. Well, now we're sending two, and boom, this fills up, and then and then it gets because it receives two, and then it and then those go off. Now let's say we increase our window size to three. Well, what's going to happen? Well, there's going to be some a third one that tries to get in here, and the two spaces are already occupied. Boom. Now you're causing the congestion. And you're causing the congestion that's hosing that's that's hosing your packets. So now what's going to happen? Well, if you have your window size of three, then one packet of each window of each of each set of datagrams is going to get dropped each time you try to send this. So you, it's going to cause these NACs to go back and, and resends to happen. So the optimal case in this is to send two at a time, and each window size you send two, and then you can wait for these to start coming back. So one of these can leave, another one can come back this way, and so on. So, so who are we asking? It says sender asks how many datagrams can be sent at a time. Because in this case, it seems like it's some intermediate uh, switchboard. Or right. So this is why you need um, you basically need to have a more adaptive algorithm. In the simple algorithm, the simplest version of it, you have you go and ask the receiver because you assume the receiver is going to you you first assume you say oh assume the network is not going to be congested let's assume the congestion is at the receiver side so let's say that the receiver's on a modem and you're on a you know you're the server and you're in a high speed line right well th that receiver is only going to be able to receive at a certain rate so you can ask them what is your ideal window size and then cuz they the receiver probably has a reasonable idea of what how fast they can receive these things so you get that back and then what you do is you use an adaptive algorithm at that point to, mod to modify the window size if it turns out that the bottleneck isn't over here on the receiver side, which you don't know, neither the, in that case, neither the sender or receiver in general will know what the, where, you know, where the congestion is here, or what's, what, you know, what it is and how it's going to change over time. Okay. Um, so, I mean, again, the way this works, you send you send several datagrams at a time before waiting for, and you send the next one before you wait, for, before the acknowledgement comes back. And then once, once uh, you get the last acknowledgement back and you, you get, in, in essence, this last one could, could piggyback permission to send another window, or that might be a separate one depending on the protocol. But you, the way, before you send the window, you need permission to start sending again because if the receiver is feeling congested at their immediate end, then you don't want to start sending another window immediately. 
Okay, so so this if if the receiver, however, you can optimize two messages, combine them both into one. If when the receiver receives the last datagram, it's ready for the next window, it could it could immediately send back piggyback with this ACK if it's received everything, a request for another window. So then in that case, you start this thing again. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Yeah, this is your window size, so you need permission to send them back. If the, if the, if the congestion happens over here, the buffer, the buffer, you know, you don't want to overflow the, the receiver's buffer because there you, you can actually have information. The receiver knows what its status of its buffer is. Um, so if it's, if the congestion is in the network, you'll end up having to discover that. If the congestion is over here on the receiver side, the receiver can give you some initial value to say, here's what I, you know, don't give me a window larger than this because I'll overflow. Round trip time times the bottleneck data rate. Now, so the bottleneck um, can be a component or, or a link within the network. It can also be on the receiver side. But uh, intuitively, there is, let's start off at the higher level, there is an optimal window size. Like we saw one here that was two. Um, and anything that's smaller than that is going to be less efficient because you get more into this lock stepping. And this equation comes out of the fact that when you put stuff, when you start throwing uh, data onto the network, the network in a sense is, the, 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 the data itself is living on the network and on the receiver, right? You can, st if you start staging packets into the network, um, so let's say you have, let's say the, the delay here is one, 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 one. You can actually have one, two, three, four, five. Suppose that you send five datagrams out, one every second, right? There's going to be five datagrams living on this network before, uh, before this, this uh, receiver actually starts getting one. So that's why you, you, um, have, you take the, uh, the round trip time into effect. And the bottleneck data rate is going to be how fast this one can start spitting them back out. And in, in, in this case, would be a receiver. Or in this case, would be how fast this one can spit them back out. So let's take a more concrete example. Suppose you had something where you had uh, this type of network. Let's put another one in for fun. And suppose that your receiver could handle um, one datagram every two seconds. And suppose that you had uh, the, the delay here was this, was one. Um, so thing is, the, it, it, for each individual link, is wh where's the bottleneck in this system? Well, it's the thing that takes the longest amount of time to, to push forward one of these datagrams. Well, the, here it's all the same. It's one, one, one. How long does it take the receiver to push one out? Two. two. It takes two, um, two seconds. Uh, so what that means is it's the bottleneck. So here what we're going to have is two times, and the round trip time is one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, just one half. And so the number that our window size is going to be here is three. So what does that mean? Suppose that um, we started feeding things in at one datagram every two seconds into here, and we did three at a time. Then what we're going to do is at time t equals zero, we're going to have, so we put one in. So after two seconds, we have one here, right? Then we put the next one in. So then that means after two seconds, one is here, and one is here, right? Two seconds later, then we go, we're over here, and then that, and then at that point, what you'll notice is that it becomes pretty apparent that the rate, a couple things. One is that the rate at which you're sending these is not congesting the receiver, right? Because it's being able to take these in and then send, and then send back um, acts, right? Process and then send back an act at the same rate that you're putting it in. But now that you've put these three in here, notice that once the act comes back over here, you're ready to send another one. So the, now you can, you can keep pumping these things out. If this act says, okay, I've received them all, then you can send another, start sending another one as soon as you receive that last act, and you can maintain a, you can maintain a high, uh, that, that maximum rate, the bottleneck rate of sending these out. 
this type of thing, um, you should probably work out a couple of examples because it, it takes, if you, if, you, if you practice with this a little bit, it'll become a little more intuitive. But try something simple like this. Try seeing what happens if you bring this, if you change these numbers here and think and use this model where you put these, these datagrams on and see how they flow through and think about the, you know, this type of model where you're, where what you, ideally what you want is this to be your, your window your max, your, 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 uh, the, the most time it takes for you to get a datagram over and an acknowledgement back. Okay, you might want to uh, play with some of this, um, uh, some of these examples in recitation with your TA, uh, or if you have any questions on this, um, see me after class. Uh, we already talked about how we can change the window time. So, ideally, what you want is as, as the, if the network is going to be your bottleneck, as congestion patterns change. You want to be able to dynamically adapt your window size to make sure that your packets aren't being dropped. And the the problem here, the big the big uh, trade-off you face is that if you lose packets, you basically have to resend either that packet or potentially the whole window. Because if if you send if you overflow the if you congest the re imagine if you start uh, if you get congestion at the receiver side, right? And you're and you and you're right at the beginning of a of a window. Then everything else is probably going to have to be dropped um, if it's so if it's very congested. So the expense could be that you actually have to resend the whole window. So too large of a window um, could get you into trouble if there's a lot of in, uh, reliability issues on the network. Oh. It's implicit in this little diagram that you've shown that we need to uh, basically uh, time release our messages um, or that are part of the window size to you know, basically distribute them evenly over the, the round trip data time. Yeah. Is that how it happens in practice, or is that only the way it looks in this model? Um, that's the way it looks in this model. If you have, if you know something about the buffer size over here, you might want to send them all at once if the, if the network can handle it. Um, but typically, I mean, there's a, there is some time delay at the sending side for, how, for, for when you're going to send these. And it, I mean, it dep it'll depend more on the specifics of the network as to how you know how exactly you want whether you want to send things all at the same time or use the rate at the at the bottleneck if you know the rate at the bottleneck, um, so that you know it, it becomes a, you have to do a little bit more analysis about you know what the specifics are. Um, there is TCP/IP does have some flow control built in, so you might want to grab a, a TCP/IP paper and and see how they actually implement it and think about these trade-offs and and build up upon this model.